Welcome to episode 58, which is Meet Jody. We're talking all about home birth in Colombia, South America. But this is part one. This week, I have released two episodes on the same day, episode 58 and 59. And 59, I hope you will stick around and listen to right after 58, where Jody talks about her home birth in America. So let's get to it. What does a contraction feel like? How do I know if I'm in labor? And what does the day of labor look like? Wait, is this normal? Hey, I'm Heidi. My best friends call me Hydes. I'm a certified birth doula, host of this podcast, and author of Birth Story, an interactive pregnancy guidebook. I have supported hundreds of women through their labor and deliveries, and I believe every one of them and you deserves a microphone and a stage. So here we are. Listen each week to get answers to these tough questions. Birth Story, where we talk about pregnancy, labor, deliveries, where we tell our stories and share our feelings. And of course, chat about our favorite baby products and motherhood. And because I'm passionate about birth outcomes, you will hear from some of the top experts in labor and delivery. Whether you are pregnant, trying desperately to get pregnant, or you just love a good birth story, I hope you will stick around and be part of this birth story family. You guys, my book is out. I mean, it is out in the world. I cannot believe it. I have been writing it for several years, and it's just mind-blowing. Birth Story, Pregnancy Guidebook and Journal is a -a one-of-a-kind discovery into your pregnancy that provides you education through storytelling. So what's it really about? In the 16 years that I have served women with every personality type, I noticed there was a huge disconnect between what my clients were craving for childbirth education in a book and the books that were actually available on the market. There seemed to be unlimited resources if you are looking for an unmedicated birth or a natural birth or a home birth. But there just weren't a lot of resources for my clients who were part of the 92% of women birthing in a hospital and very much open to medical interventions like an epidural, nitrous oxide, and opioid medications. So I wrote that book to fill the gap for you. Week by week throughout your pregnancy, you will engage with material meant to educate and empower you as you plan for your own birth story hospital, medicated, unmedicated, or something in between. You are welcomed each week with a postcard from the womb, which is an adorable note from your baby about their miraculous development, as well as the amazing changes occurring within you. Then you are invited to use an uplifting birth affirmation and to respond to an introspective journaling prompt to document your feelings, curiosities, and wonders every single week. With room to memorialize your own birth story, this book will become a memory keeper and a legacy gift for your baby. You are encouraged to read one of my favorite birth stories each week filled with childbirth education, tidbits, and explanations of important medical terms and procedures. These are real-life accounts shared with permission from the births that I've attended during my career as a doula. And I gave you a great mix. In the 42-week guide to your pregnancy and 42 birth stories, seven of them end in cesarean section. About half are unmedicated and the other half are medicated deliveries. This is a judgment-free book. So take what you need from each element and leave the rest. Okay, are you ready to buy? I would love for you to go to birthstory.com and buy it directly from me but I totally get it if you're an Amazon girl. You can head to amazon.com and just type in birth story pregnancy and the book should pop up. I'll deliver it straight to your doorstep. And I would venture to say that you might be an audiobook kind of woman because you're listening to a podcast. So if you would prefer to listen to this book, then I have recorded it and it is available for download at audible.com or on your Audible app. Thank you for being part of the birth story community. I am so excited for you to have this book in your hand. 
once you've purchased it and it has arrived. I hope that you will give me your thoughts and feedback and don't forget to take a selfie with your book and post it on Instagram and tag at Birth Story Podcast. Welcome, Jody, to the Birth Story Podcast. How are Hi, you? Hi, I'm great. Thank you so much for having me here. I'm so excited. I am really excited too. I know very little. I just know that we're going to talk about your two home births, one in Columbia, South America, not South Carolina. Uh, and, that's right. <laughs> and one here in North America and North Carolina. So I'm really excited and let's dig in. Tell us though, like a little bit about like who you are, how old are your kids? And then I want to know, like, how were you living in Columbia, South America, and now North Carolina and how that shakes out? Okay. Well, I'm originally from North Carolina and um, I have two kids. I have a three, almost four-year-old daughter named Quincy and a five-month-old daughter named Joy. I grew up here in the Charlotte area and went to university here where my husband and I met in the education department um, at UNC Charlotte. And he, after we graduated, he moved to Bulgaria with the Peace Corps. And I stayed here in North Carolina and I was in the teaching fellows program at UNC Charlotte. So I was teaching in North Carolina for four years. And so he lived in Bulgaria for two and a half years and we did long distance. I went to visit him a couple of times. And then when we knew uh, that when he finished that, we wanted to travel together. So when he finished his um, service in the Peace Corps, which he, he taught um, in a small school in a small village there in Bulgaria. And when he moved back, we spent a year kind of figuring out what we wanted to do while I was still teaching here and finishing up my um, commitment with the Teaching Fellows Scholarship. And we first moved to Costa Rica and we lived in Monteverde there for two years and we weren't quite ready to move home. And we found Manizales, Colombia, and we taught at a school there. Both, Both of the schools that we taught at were mostly local families and, and, and children. And so bilingual kids, we taught English immersion and we lived in uh, Colombia for four years and we just loved it. It's a beautiful place to live, a beautiful place to work, a very, very special time in our lives. And so after my first daughter was born, we spent her first two years in Colombia and we were just ready to um, be a little closer to family, and we moved back to Charlotte. Wow. Okay, so my family is Colombian, and they're from Bogota. And so where were you in Colombia? We were in Manizales, okay. which is um, west of Bogota. So we always flew in and out of Bogota, and especially when, once we had the baby, we were, uh, we would spend a couple days, we would split up the travel and fly from Manizales to Bogota and stay there for a day or two before we came back to Charlotte. And so I did spend some, some time in Bogota too. Oh, cool. Okay. So you're living in Colombia and tell me about getting pregnant. Was this planned? Yeah, it was. We were, um, ready I had, I'm one of those people who have always wanted to be a mom and I was, I've been ready for a long time and, you know, I never really imagined starting my family abroad. Uh, but we, when we moved to Costa Rica, we met, we were friends with several other families who had kids who had either started their families abroad or were traveling long-term with their families. And it really just opened my eyes to what, that can be like and the possibilities there. And we got actually, we got married when we were in Costa Rica. We had our wedding in Monteverde where we lived. And when we moved to coast to Colombia, we were were ready to start our family. And so we actually found out and got a pregnancy test and I took it at home. It was my husband's birthday. I took it at home by myself. I was so excited. And, uh, when he got home later that day, we had celebrated his birthday and I was waiting to tell him. And, uh, after we had celebrated his birthday and had dinner and exchange, you know, give him a gift and everything. I said, I think I have one more birthday gift for you. And I showed him the pregnancy test and that was the beginning of that. And 
you know, we were very fortunate. The, the school that we worked in had just a phenomenal support system for foreign teachers. And so, you know, my Spanish, we had already lived for two years in Costa Rica and we were on our, so I, at this point I had, it was my fourth year living in a Spanish speaking place. So my Spanish was pretty good, but we had some staff at the school where we worked who really helped me navigate finding a doctor and um, appointments and, and all of that. So did you have a primary care provider? Yeah, I had seen the doctor that I ended up seeing for the first half of my pregnancy. I had seen him the previous year just for like a yearly physical, but not really talked much about family planning so much. And he was a gynecologist that many of the foreign staff, he, he was a parent of a kid at our school. And a lot of the women teachers at our school who were from North um, United States and Canada would, would go to him. And so he uh, was a well-trusted and spoke a lot of English, which helped a lot too. Excellent. So you went to see this provider for the first, like say four, four to five months of your pregnancy. And yes. if you had continued with this provider, did he deliver in a, in a hospital setting? Okay. So um, I saw him until I was 20 weeks pregnant and I loved him so much and did not want to see anyone else. Um, but it got to the, he no longer, he was shifting his practice to oncology care, gynecological oncology, and he no longer was delivering babies. And he basically was like, Jody, I, I love you, but you got to find someone else who's going to deliver your baby. Started seeing Quincy, my daughter was born at home, but I did not know that that was an option for me until very late in my pregnancy. So I, after I left Dr. Ruiz, the one um, that I saw for the first half, I, I saw actually two other doctors um, in the meantime, and then found out when I was 36 weeks pregnant <laughs> that a home birth was an option. Okay. So what did you know about home birth like before then? I don't know if you remember that show, uh, A Birth Story on TLC, a long time ago. And I have these vivid memories of being probably like 11 or 12 years old and being home from school and on days off when I would, they would play these kind of shows in the milk day and just being so enamored with these birth stories. And I would just watch these marathons of birth story TV shows. The, all of the different ways to give birth and the process of giving birth have been on my heart. I've been drawn to them for most of my life. And so I was always interested in it. And I just didn't know that it was an option at all in Monty Sally's because it was, I mean, there's definitely not a home birth community. And the way that I found out that I could have a home birth was we were approaching the end of the pregnancy and I asked us to tour the hospital. And as I'm touring the hospital, you know, of course, my husband and I kind of stick out. We're um, not Colombian and our Spanish is not perfect at all. And so we were talking and I was asking about if there, were, if there was a possibility to have nurses or doctors that spoke English I wasn't very confident in my Spanish speaking skills giving during labor. You know, I mean, it's one thing to speak Spanish at the grocery store. It's another thing to do it like while you're giving birth for the first time. And they recommended me a doula that they knew of and they gave me her name. When I met with her, we had this hour long discussion about how she could support me uh, because I don't know if you know this, but in, in Colombia, most women are not accompanied by their husband while they're giving birth. So she would, but I would have been had I given birth in the hospital because we have private insurance, but most women don't. And so she was talking about the different ways that she could support me and the different ways that she has supported women in the past. At the very end of our meeting, sort of very casually, she said, oh, and I, I also do home births. And I was like, whoa, wait a minute. Like, we need, this is a whole other conversation now. So we talked about that. Like I said, it was very late in my pregnancy. I was like 36 weeks pregnant. 
And it really threw everyone in my family for a loop. Yes. Tell me more. I want in. Exactly. Yes. I was like, wow, if I would have known that an hour ago, this whole conversation would have been about that. I was very eager and excited to, to learn that that was something so, that I could, I could try. Now, what gestation were you when you went into uh, spontaneous labor? 39 weeks and four days, I think. 39, Just, four. Okay. Mm-hmm. So for almost the next four weeks, you mm-hmm. shifted towards like the home birth setting. That's right. Yeah. I mean, I, I want to hear all about it. Like walk me through, like, do you have <laughs> to like rent your birthing tub? Like, does your doula yeah. coordinate these things for you? Yeah. I mean, how does this, you know, how does this work? Okay. So our midwife, she was from our city, but she lived about an hour away and she worked uh, with a doctor um, who worked in the hospital setting, but also worked privately with Marcella, the the midwife. And she, in the weeks following, I continued to get parallel care at, um, with the OB that I um, was seeing at the end of my pregnancy. And she actually didn't do any of my like prenatal appointments towards the end, but she did host like a like a seminar kind of for me and my husband in our home. And she brought all of like the um, birth tools and like uh, the pelvis and like showed us about like the different stages of birth. And it was very informative, especially, you know, for me and my husband to experience that together and talk about, I also studied hypno babies. And so I had some learned a lot through that, but she was very communicative with me over the phone and was just very available. And as we got closer, um, she would check in on me and she had all of her materials. And so I didn't have to rent a tub, which, I mean, there was really no, no way to do that, especially if, if I would have had to get my own materials, it, it wouldn't have been possible to do it in that amount of time to like get them shipped to Columbia. Okay. Um, but she had everything. The only thing I think that we got was like a tarp for the bed, but she had the hose to connect it to the shower. She had the liner. She had the umbilical cord clamps. Like she had everything, which was different than my experience having a home birth here where I ordered the birth kit. That is awesome. And I love that you did hypno babies. I'm a certified hypno babies doula. Uh, so yes, I'm- it was, I love, I did it for my uh, second birth too. And it's just, I would recommend it to anyone. Hey, it's Heidi. I'm interrupting the podcast to let you know about a free resource that I've created for you at birthstory.com. All you have to do is go to birthstory.com and then click the tab that says the workbook. Once you put your email address in, an entire resource library of all of my secret sauces are available to you for free as my thank you for listening to the Birth Story podcast and being part of this community. At birthstory.com, under the workbook, you will find a birth plan template, articles on circumcision, delayed cord clamping, flipping a breech baby, packing your hospital bag, acupressure points, placenta encapsulation, and so much more. There are over 20 free articles ready for you to download at birthstory.com. Now let's get back to this amazing episode. Yes, I would as well. (laughs) It just changes everything. So if anyone's listening and they're not familiar with hypno babies, it's a type of self-guided relaxation or partner-guided even relaxation through script reading. It's a very specific type of childbirth education. But one of the main examples I love to give is if you walk into a hospital, at least in the United States, to give birth, one of the first things they ask you in triage is, Honey, what's your pain level? (laughs) One to 10. Mm -hmm. And, you know, vomit. But in babies, it's, you know, a very specific language. So we do not say labor. We say birthing time. We don't say contraction. We say surges or pressure waves. Mm -hmm. And we certainly don't say pain scale comfort scale or like how comfortable are you mm-hmm. on a scale of one to 10. So it's really just reframing the mind for positive outcomes through positive language. I definitely had a, a very positive experience with it, no babies both times. And I found it to be very empowering 
in that way that I could understand more about what's happening to my body. And it wasn't this like unpredictable, I mean, it is unpredictable, but it, it wasn't this scary, unpredictable thing that was happening to me that I could understand more about how to manage the sensations that I was experiencing. Yeah. But it really helps you be an active participant in the process of your birthing time. So one of the main questions we get is how do I know I'm in labor and like, Mm -hmm. what does it look like? And so at 39 weeks and four days, or maybe even 39 weeks and three days, I don't know what time Mm -hmm. you went into your birthing time, but Jody, walk us through how you knew for sure that you were in your birthing time. Okay. In the, about the week before I would have very, very mild menstrual cramps in the early morning hours, sometimes in the night. And, um, but then they would go away basically immediately when I would get up in the morning, the week of the birth, I gave birth on a Thursday and that Monday I felt this like enormous surge of energy and I wanted, we lived in the Andes mountains in these a gorgeous city, but right outside the city, I mean, the, the edges of the city were right into nature. And so there was this hit, like mountain, I call it a hill, but it was really a mountain that we would walk. And I just like, I was like, I've got to go, I've got to get up there. And so we just like pushed it. And that day I had like some very light bleeding and I thought, Oh, maybe, I don't know, you know, but nothing happened. The next day on Tuesday, we went to go see my, from one of my last prenatal appointments. And I told him that I had been having some light menstrual, like that felt like menstrual cramps. And he said, well, those could be contractions. Um, Let me send you to the hospital for monitoring just to see if you are having contractions. So we went, they did like 20 minutes or so of monitoring. And they, I remember sitting there with my husband and they gave me a sheet and it was a flat line. They were like, no, you're not having any contractions whatsoever. And I had kind of convinced myself that it would, you know, I would be at least a week over because that's, I don't know why I thought that, but. Because the average gestation for a first time mom is 41 weeks and one day. Right. Probably hypno babies taught you that. Exactly. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) And so we went home. That was a Wednesday, the the Wednesday that we um, got the monitoring and we went home and we were like, okay, let's just, you know, cozy in. It was summer break. And so we had stayed in Columbia for the summer and most of our friends had been traveling and were returning. It was the end of July. We're returning back to Columbia to get ready for school to start again. And so we had some friends over that night. We ha- we ate pizza and just hung out and I didn't feel anything. So then th- that night I went to bed, woke up the next morning and I had had some of the light cramps again, but I mean, just very mild. And I stood up and went to the bathroom and right as I was passing through the door, I felt like a surge. It, it That's the best word to describe what it felt like. It was like a surge that sort of had a rise and fall. And I remember looking at my husband and I was like, I think I had a contraction. I think that I, that felt different. It felt more like a rise that came to a peak and then just kind of fell back down. And then when I went to the bathroom, I had the bloody show and I texted my midwife and she was like, okay, this means your body's getting ready. And I had read so much that I was like, not ready to go there yet. I knew that, you know, pre-labor could last days. And so I wasn't in for the first while, I wasn't really convinced that I was actually going to have a baby that day, but really within, so that was like seven in the morning within the hour or two hours, my, they were coming every like seven minutes and I decided to get a shower I was looking at my notes from, from those days and by mid morning, the, the surges were coming every five minutes. And so we called the midwife and she started headed that way. And once I knew the midwife was on her way was when I was finally convinced that, okay, this is probably going to happen today. (laughs) Oh, I love it. 
Well, I really feel like this is just an accurate depiction of the way that most spontaneous birthing times or labors begin. And it's really like you get this warm up period for about a week beforehand. You know, I'm curious to see if you had lost your mucus plug in that, you know, week or if that was when you had your bloody show, if that was the first mucus that you had seen. No, I definitely did lose it throughout. It's just, especially as a first time mom, it's such a bizarre, these things that happen. You're like, wow, okay. That seems like something different. And I remember taking a picture and my mucus plug had come out in big pieces. And I remember sending pictures of it to my uh, midwife and her just saying, yep, that's, that looks about right. You're doing great. Just keep on trucking. This uh, is but- so normal. My whole entire phone is like filled with <laughs> pictures from like almost every client. And even like, I got one the other day that was like literally three little drops of blood on the toilet, you know, in the middle of her birthing time. And it was like, is this normal? And I'm like, oh yeah, there's going to be a lot more than that. Coming. Yeah. yeah. You know, so like, yes. so lots of blood and lots of mucus are signs of cervical softening and ripening and dilation. And so those are all really good things. But just the way that your birthing time unfolded, some cramps and some warming up, and you know your mucus plug coming out and just different irritability and then surges of energy and some other people will have like frequent pooping or urination or even they'll feel a little like off or foggy. So they'll go from that burst of energy to like the fogginess. And it kind of sounds like you went through all of that for that week before. And mm-hmm. that's kind of like you said, you were in your birthing time. Like I consider that it's called latent labor or prodromal labor. It's like the beginning, the buildup. And then you had a distinct start, a distinct peak and a distinct end to a surge. And then that surge grew longer and stronger and closer together over the next couple of hours. That is the best way that you just went through that I could describe how to tell that you are in active labor is that distinct start and peak and stop and then and they're getting kind of closer together and mm-hmm. a little bit stronger and a little bit longer. So your midwife heads over and yes. like what are you and your husband doing? Okay, so this was in 2016 and I don't know if it's still on now but there was a show called Stranger Things and my husband was really into that show at that time. And so for the first like hour or two we would we were laying in bed he was watching Netflix and I would just like nudge him when when I felt something start and he was timing them on his phone and so he was um we were just there together just enjoying the time just that kind of being chill and then eventually I decided I I remember having read that a change in activity could let you know if it was pre-labor or like real so I decided to take a shower and to see if how things felt. And um, I stayed in the shower for a long time and it was just glorious. And it helped me. It felt really nice. And it also, my contractions just kept going. And so I knew that it was probably going to keep going. And there's a point where I kind of passed over the, the reins to my husband to, to stay in touch with the midwife. And he was sending her screenshots of like my the timings that he had taken of how far apart things were and how long they were lasting. So my first contraction that I felt was like 7 a.m. that morning. Around noon is when my midwife, who was also the doula, arrived with the doctor. So the midwife, Marcella, she acted as a doula in our city for many families because there's not a huge home birth community in Manisales, she served mostly in hospitals as a doula. So they all get there around noon. Yes. And what phase of active labor are you in at this point, just five hours later? When they arrived, my contractions were around five minutes or less apart. Labor first started, it was very manageable. I was talking and able to especially talk between contractions. I would stop and focus when it, when one came. By the time the midwife arrived, I was in the zone. I listened to my the birthday affirmations with hypnobabies. 
And I kind of, I stood next to the crib that we had set up in our room. And I just felt this little bubble around me that I didn't want to leave. There was a little, maybe two or three foot circle that I stayed in for hours. And I stood and rocked back and forth, vocalizing. And I just felt like this cozy little bubble that I didn't want to go out of. And I stayed there for a while. And when the midwife came, she had this warm red rug that she came and that she put on the floor under me. And she would occasionally come and give me some oil massages on my back. But I remember being next to the crib, staying in that little tiny little space that I wanted to stay in and just really focusing They got started pretty much right away setting up the birthing pool and um, getting the water going. They did a combination. They hooked up to our shower, but my husband also put on like pots of hot uh, water on our stove to pour in. And it's just this, I mean, I get goosebumps thinking back to those moments, just being in such a different world and watching them come and go out of the room and getting things ready. And there was a point, I think, I mean, maybe by, let's say, like two o'clock, more or less. So when they first arrived at 12 o'clock, they did check my dilation, and I was at seven centimeters then. I stayed next to the crib for a while, and then eventually Marcella said to the doctor, I think she's ready, because she, and, and this wasn't the case with my second home birth, but she wanted me to wait until I was 10 centimeters before I got into the pool. She at one point said, I think she's ready. And she later told me that she could just tell with all of her experience, she could tell by the way my breathing sounded that I was at 10 centimeters. And so, and they checked and I was, and I remember just thinking back, I was just in awe of that, that she could just hear my breath and tell. I think being a midwife, a doula, birth worker of any kind is sort of a calling. And it's hard to explain sometimes this concept. Like a lot of my hospital birthing clients will say like, well, how do we know when to go transfer to the hospital? And I don't know how to explain it to Mm. them other than like, not just me, but my other colleagues in the doula community, like we are listening to your body and your breath and feeling the sensations. And, you know, I put my hands on your uterus and I can feel that the, how strong the surges are. And it's very easy to tell if someone is at four or at seven or at 10 without any cervical exam at all. So to hear you honor that is just, awesome. It was beautiful. Uh It was just, it was really wonderful. And so when, after that, I I got in, in the pool and it was just heaven. (laughs) The contractions kept coming, but they just, the edge, it took the edge off. I remember I would, the feeling, the rest that would come between the surges, I actually fell asleep. And a couple of times I would have dreams between contractions and, or like wake myself up snoring. And I mean, this is, you know, at this point in my birthing time, that rest time would sometimes be less than a minute, but I would fall asleep and um, then just like wake back up and keep going. Yeah. And do the work that you needed to do. Mm -hmm. And then It is so amazing that our body gets flooded with natural opioids. And, you know, often the process, especially in a hospital birth, it's interrupted with, you know, epidurals and bright lights and people talking and, you know, all of these other things, but especially at home or as as natural um, as possible, it allows our body to surge with natural endorphins and opioids and and oxytocin and all these things that make us feel so drugged and so mm-hmm. good and can fall into people say how it's not how could you sleep in between and it's like 
well, you just have to trust that yeah. it will happen. Mm-hmm. You will be so, your body will take such good care of you that you will rest and sleep in between. Now at seven at noon, you that would be technically the medical definition of, you know, transformation um, or, you know, transition. Mm-hmm. And so you're doing hard, hard work. So what time was it when, you know, between seven centimeters and 10 centimeters when you climbed into the tub? What time is it now? I think around, so just to give you the full scope, she was born at 348 in the afternoon. Wow. Yeah. And, and then, so I think I got in the pool yeah. around, I, I, I'm not sure on that. Like after the midwives came, I, I know when she was born, but the so the timing in between there is yeah, not, it's a little know, fuzzy. It's, it's a little fuzzy, but so I was seven centimeters at noon when they arrived, and then I would say maybe like between a one and two, one o'clock and two o'clock is when I got in, and then I um, worked in the in the water for a while, and then I remember laying there, laying back, and then I started pushing. Like the the first time, it was like this little tiny push. And I remember my eyes popped open and I looked at Marcella and I was like, I think I just pushed. And she just smiled and said, okay. <laughs> and I just, I, I didn't expect that, that like my body really just knew when to push and I wasn't expecting it. I didn't tell my body to push. It just did. And it was just a phenomenal experience. It is miraculous the fetal ejection reflex and feeling it and allowing your body to experience the whole circle. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just, it's magical. And I bet you didn't push for too long. It's amazing that it starts off with little, we start with little, like kind of grunty pushes. Mm -hmm, Exactly. I would imagine. And sometimes you know, I'm not sure was yours. You may have one or two surges where you don't, you're not really feeling grunty or pushy. And then it comes on again. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, exactly. Go, or was yeah. it there to stay? Well, it started kind of slow. And so my, and also my, my waters didn't break through all of this. So I started, like you were saying, kind of a little grunty push and they would be small and not last the whole time, but, but then it didn't take long for it to kind of pick up. And the sensation of the contractions really faded. And then like the urge and like the power of the pushes took over. And it was kind of, it was almost satisfying in a different way because that's when you could really start to feel something happening. I remember telling them my wife, I can feel her moving down. And I could just thinking about it now, like you can feel the head of a human being moving down in your body. And it was, it was the pushing part for me was really motivating because it was so powerful and I could feel something happening. Yeah. And it's also an awareness of like the in-between worlds, right? Mm -hmm. Like you're in this labor land world. You're kind of aware that these other people are serving you in our pushing time. We sort of come back to our body too. And then feeling the head move down and kind of feeling the transition of like, we're moving away from being pregnant and now moving into full motherhood. It's absolutely. Yeah. I mean, you said it so beautifully. So Quincy emerges in the water. Yeah. So she, okay. So I was laying back and I was pushing and the midwife asked me to get up on my knees. And just minutes before she was born is when my water broke. And so I remember that feeling as well and seeing it like come into the water. And there was meconium in the waters, which wasn't a problem. But then I got up on my knees and I just pushed harder than I have ever pushed before. And her cord was wrapped twice and the doctor reached down and scooped scooped it off her neck. And when she came out in those last moments, you know, it was just 
like nothing. I mean, just can't describe. I could have never expected or understood or imagined what the room felt like in those moments where it was silent except for like the roar of my pushes and the people in the room with me it it felt it was quiet but electric you know everything the air was charged and it was just so beautiful and I felt so respected and honored by the people who were there with me and she came out and um, she took a minute to, to breathe. And just as uh, they were going to give her some air, she took that first little gurgly cry. And it was just, it was divine. It was just something for someone who's been watching birth stories on TV on her days off from school since I was 12 years old, I could have never even dreamed of how magical that moment was. And it just, I mean, when I think about it, I can feel it. I can feel the way my skin felt. I can see the way the sun shone in the room. I can see the vernix on her skin. And it was just the happiest moment. It was really beautiful. I mean, I have goosebumps all over my body and like (laughs) some tears in my eyes, like unbelievable. Well, tell me about the third stage of labor and delivering the placenta. Mm -hmm. So we stayed, I stayed in the pool for a few minutes and um, my husband cut the cord and the placenta didn't come super quickly. And we... And I got up on the bed and the midwife massaged my stomach. And after waiting a little bit, she very, very gently, she had the umbilical cord, but she kind of just very gently moved it in circles. And eventually it did come. I did for exactly four weeks postpartum experience some hemorrhaging which later found out was due to retained placenta. And I had a DNC when I was four weeks postpartum to remedy that. And I actually had some, some challenges with my, my five, just five months ago when my second baby was born with the placenta as well, having some, some challenges coming. But once with Quincy, once the placenta came, all was well. And we were already home. And so we just, I did tear a little bit. And so the doctor was there and she was able to stitch me some. And we just stayed in bed for the rest of the day. And we had soup and just basked in the glory of a new person there in our room. What a beautiful birth story. And I would have done anything to have been your doula in the middle of Colombia on the edge of the Andes mountains, like mm-hmm. feeling that sunshine with mm-hmm. you as you became a mom. I mean, I just really, you're the way you're an incredible storyteller and the way that you shared that experience. I think all of us listening just felt like we were right there, mm-hmm. you know, with you, Jody. I have two other questions about okay. your birth. Okay. Um, the first is, did you encapsulate your placenta? Is that something that your midwife offered in Colombia? Um, I did not encapsulate my placenta. I did plant it. There is, you've probably seen, it's a common uh, exotic flower called the bird of paradise. Yes. And we, and that's a very common flower there. And I planted it with a bird of paradise and it was very special to me and it bloomed for the first time on the day that my grandfather passed away and it just was a very beautiful symbol to me about life and death and the circle and um, so that was a very special special time. I think that that is very symbolic and I think your grandfather was definitely speaking to you in that bloom. Mm -hmm. Wow. 
Well, Jody, before we finish on this episode, will you share with all of us like what has been your favorite like baby or mommy or pregnancy product through your whole experience and your inauguration into motherhood? Mm -hmm. Well, I'm thinking back to those first days of motherhood with my first baby. And when my milk came in, it came in a lot. And I remember being like weepy from the hormones and tired and overwhelmed. And then also like waking up in puddles of milk. And I, a coworker of mine gave me some of the milk catchers that go inside. You can wear them inside your bra or inside of a nursing shirt. They saved me a lot of sanity because I would just take them in one feeding would collect like, or overnight would collect like four or more ounces just from like sitting there. And so I would just pour them in. I would keep a little cooler next to my bed with bottles in it. And I would wake up and just pour it out into the bottles with a little ice pack in there. And so it kept me from being so milky all over my shirt and sheets and everywhere. And also I saved the milk. She didn't actually end up taking a bottle, but we would use it in like baths and and different things like that. So that saved me a lot of sanity in my first couple couple weeks. Is there a particular brand of milk catcher that you recommend? So the ones that I used in Colombia, I do not know. They were given to me and I'm not, I don't think that they were even marked with a brand, but um, I did use some with my second baby. The brand that I used were Philips Avent Comfort Breast Shell. And those were the ones that you used when you were back in the United States. Yes. So. Mm-hmm. Well, Jody, we are so excited to hear about the second home birth, Joy, and how mm-hmm. different that was, you know, from Quincy's birth and birthing in Colombia and then birthing here in the state. And so everyone will just have to stick around for the next episode where we continue on in your birth stories. So thank you for sharing part one. And everyone stick around for part two. Thank you so much for having me. It was a pleasure, Heidi. Thank you for listening to Birth Story. My goal is you will walk away from each episode with a clear picture of how labor and delivery might go and that you will feel empowered by the end of your pregnancy to speak up, plan and prepare for the birth you want. 